Welcome to the Confluence Cast presented by Columbus Underground. We are a weekly Columbus-centric podcast focusing on the civics, lifestyle, entertainment, and people of our city. I'm your host, Tim Fulton. This week, as Columbusites, we examine the evolution and identity of the city from a singular point of view. That's not a bad thing, but an outsider's perspective is always helpful. Today, we hear from Mark Snyder, a former Columbus resident, whose journey through writing and theater has woven a tapestry of experiences both in and out of the capital city. Mark reflects on the essence of Columbus, the kindness, scrappiness, and the collaborative spirit that defines its culture, and he shares his journey of rediscovery in a city that continues to evolve and challenge its own identity. You can get more information on what we discussed today in the show notes for this episode at theconfluencecast.com. Enjoy the interview. Sitting down here with Mark Snyder, <laughs> writer, uh, former Columbus resident, yeah, Flanor. Flanor, I think that's a good word. A wanderer, a wanderer, a podcaster of yes. I'm sorry, your podcast as well. Yeah. G- please give an introduction to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Well, first of all, I'm really thrilled to be at Columbus Underground's offices. We're for the, pleased to have you for the first time in forever, and uh, and be on the Confluence Cast with my friend, long time friend. We've been friends a long time, indeed. Tim Fulton. I've known you since you were like in high school. I think our relationship can rent a car. It. Oh, I, well, I would yeah. hope so. I yeah. would hope so. That's a wonderful feeling um um i'm a podcaster and i write plays and i write essays and i um i'm a a personality i guess Mm -hmm. that's what i do and i i'm a flaneur which means that i wander around and um make observations and have adventures and write about them and talk about them and people are always asking me what i think about things and so i i share it freely with them and I think the thought today is a little bit of a love letter to Columbus. Yeah. Right? You're from here. I, not originally. Yeah. I So I grew up... I'm really happy to be here, Tim. Um, <laughs> I uh, I grew up um, about three hours north of here in a town called Warren, Ohio, named after Warren G. Harding, our president. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, my dad was an, a Buckeye. He was an Ohio State alumni. And so we came to Columbus a lot when I was a kid to w- go to games. And then I moved to Columbus specifically to Westerville, Ohio in 1995 to go to Otterbein College at mm-hmm. the time, now university. And uh, part of the reason I went to Otterbein was because Columbus was so close. And I, I, don't, I didn't think I was ready for a huge big city, but I okay. was definitely ready for um, something bigger than Warren and Youngstown, Ohio. Fair. And it was a good place to come. And there was so much um, to to so much trouble to get into in Columbus, but then go safely back to the quiet, peaceful village of Westerville, Ohio. Indeed. And yeah. uh, but we did know each other before that, but we really, uh, you had actually just graduated, but we mm-hmm. pledged the same fraternity. Yes, we did. Pi Beta Sigma. Amen. OFA. OFA, baby. That's our shout out. <laughs> um, you left and went to New York. I did. I did. I was, um, so I wanted to be a writer and a playwright and, uh, and go to New York. And that was always my dream that was always my dream and um i was lucky because everybody in my class at otterbein we all either went to new york or la and Mm -hmm. it was pretty much down the middle so i went with a whole group of us and it never people always like well how did you how did you get the gumption to go to new york i'm like there was never a question of of going and you know i was cashing in my childhood savings bonds for the cash and friends were working at Bath and Beyond at Easton Mall to mm-hmm. get money that summer and then there was a September 1 we were all headed headed east well and a little bit of context right Otterbein is very well known not necessarily in the city but nationwide yeah or at least it was at the time I believe mm-hmm. it still is for having a fantastic BFA acting, BFA yes. musical theater, yes. BA. I think you got a BA in theater. No, I got a BA in English in because English. I, okay. I wanted to be able to do a bunch of things, do radio, do newspaper journalism. But you were around sort of that group. I was around. Well, I'm a theatrical being. I, can, I think we can all tell. <laughs> and, I, yeah. But, uh, and in addition to, so you're surrounded by those folks. And in addition to that, those folks did, um, 
part of their program was an internship. Correct. One full semester yeah. away. And then they would come back with all this kind of intel. And right. So we kind of all came and, and, and there was a great, particularly like, uh, and I have to say, you know, being in a fraternity like Pi Beta Sigma was great because there was already a network of apartments and places to live mm-hmm. and things like that to kind of go into when you got to New York. So none of it was ever intimidating other right. than the money. The money was really the yeah. thing. And I remember like going to visit Astoria, like it would just be like, oh, this is the house where like, oh yeah, that's now the girl's apartment. This is the boy's yeah. apartment. And like how everybody just sort of congregates pretty quickly. Yeah. And you're right. Like goes out for Intel, has some experience. Like I think the most interesting part of that internship that I was told, I think this was right after I left was you go and you work in like a casting agency. Yes. But you're your training is in like vocal performance. Yes. And the purpose of the internship is actually forget. I'm going to date us a little bit. It's to learn how to use a fax machine. Yeah. It's to do like the little menial yeah. office stuff yeah. that like, Hey, you got to be able to do that to be helpful. Well, in that exactly, space. exactly. And I think, you know, getting a liberal arts education at Otterbein specifically at English, because I was able to take so many different kinds of classes and I was mm-hmm. doing so much on such a small campus mm-hmm. that when I got to New York, I really was able to pivot and do all kinds of jobs to survive and, and still have time to do my, make my plays and do my art and mm-hmm. do all of that stuff in a way that I think some people really struggle because a lot of people just think they go to New York and get a job as a waitress or in a restaurant or a waiter or like a service job. And they do. Correct. But, but also <laughs> there were all these other things I could also we could also do. And and a lot of that was through these internships and also through just kind of like the word of mouth of our network. Yeah. That kind of came. So we kind of came and conquered. Yeah. It was, and really it was great. good. It was fun. At you though I think more than some other folks yeah. have sort of identified Columbus as like, that's the home base and that's what I go back to, or that's what I care about. Yeah. I think I was, you romanticize it. I, as, I, I think I do. That's okay. a really interesting observation. I think I do. I, I loved Columbus when I was, when I was here, when yeah. I lived in Westerville. Um, I, I did so much down here and, um, you know, I was gay. I was going to the gay, gay bars for the first time. Mm-hmm. Um, m- many of which are gone now in downtown and it was downtown Columbus. Yeah. Um, so I was coming down at least two or three times a week to go out with my friends and, and also there was just so much going on and the short North and there was, there was a bustling energy, um, but still a kind of grittiness that mm-hmm. didn't intimidate any of us. You know, there were places like there was a, my first gay bookstore I ever got to go to, um, was the open book, yep. which was on the corner. Um, I don't know what's there now, but it's, I it, think it's what Rue is now. Yes. It's an Indian place. Yes, yeah. yeah. And, um, and, and also like there were coffee shops and there was the, the nursing home for the, the, the elderly across the street from that, that, that closed down. And, you know, there was reality theater, which was a, a, a theater mm-hmm. company. I did a show with them when I was a senior in, in college because I wanted to do a play downtown and mm-hmm. we were this big hit all, all year and, and all summer and it was so much fun. And so I really, I really had a, it was a very magical right before the internet kind of took over everything. Nobody had cell phones. Mm-hmm. None of that was happening. So it was kind of the last little moment of that. And then when I could finally afford to come back to Columbus around 2001, 2002, I found a lot of things had changed, but the feeling and the vibe that I got from Columbus was there. So I all I always make a habit of coming back, and, yeah. and I come back pretty consistently. I'm back at least a couple times a year, if yeah. not more, depending. I also have a wonderful sister and her family, her husband and, and my niece, who's now 11, they live in Dublin mm-hmm. and they've, they've been here this whole time too. And I had a, a, I have cousins in Hilliard. I have a cousin in Westerville for a long time. So I had family here too, that could kind of also justify the trips. Mm-hmm. But as I would come back, I would toggle between family time and then the artists and the people I knew in Columbus. And as as that kind of went on in the 2000s and the 2010s, 
more and more of my friends were in Columbus doing really interesting work and creative work all yeah. over the place. Well, and you've had work produced by like Available Light. Yeah. I had connection with those folks. Yeah. And, and we, that was through Otterbein. I had a lighting design teacher named Dana White mm-hmm. who was at Otterbein and he's since retired, but he hosted a, he was co-teaching a class with Matt, with Matt Slaybaugh, mm-hmm. who was the artistic director and one of the founders of Available Light. And um, they invited me to come speak at the class and it was about collaboration. The class mm. was because he was a designer. Matt was a director. How do you, and and a theater maker? How do you how do you do that mm-hmm. together? And so they had me come in to talk about being a playwright and being a writer in that process. Mm-hmm. And so what was really cool about it was it was one of those things where. I met Matt and I was like, huh? And I clocked him when I walked in. And then right after he was like, could we go get coffee? Right. Which in New York, it just doesn't happen that way. It's like, yeah, I'm available in three weeks so we can make an appointment. (laughs) I got to rush off to my next thing now. But we had an hour after to hang and we went up and we, we got a coffee and just talked. And it was like I... And I, I, I'm, he's gonna, he would blush if he said, said this, but like, I felt like I'd known him forever. Yeah. Well, and he is, for, for longtime Columbusites, he is Stephen Slaybaugh's brother. Stephen Slaybaugh yeah. being the longtime music critic of Columbus Alive. Yeah. And so, like, he is sort of, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with saying this. One of ours. Yes. Right? Very he's a, much so. He is a Columbusite. And I think that, you know, and it's getting to... And then from that conversation, I started... Every time I came to Columbus, I was spending time... Making time to spend with Matt and his wife, Acacia Duncan, who's an actor in town mm-hmm. and amazing. And they're both such creative, dynamic, wonderful people that chose to stay in Columbus Mm -hmm. and build their lives here. And as I met the available light company, the theater and their ensemble, I was meeting other people like that are like, these people could work all over the country and Mm -hmm. they're choosing to make art for their community here. Mm -hmm. And that was the thing that was a real lesson when I started spending time and working with them. Um, And I, I did a couple of plays in their new play festival. We did, you know, readings and workshops and it was It was so fulfilling for me and they treated me like royalty, which I love to be treated like. (laughs) And, 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 you know, and I, I would, I would get, uh, Matt would give me a random record he picked up and be like, Hey, I just was thinking of you. I brought this along and seeing the level of talent, it was a real lesson to me to see how people were choosing to stay in Columbus and, and build lives around art and creativity here that could only really happen here in the way that they wanted it to happen Hmm. for their community that was here, not the community that they were trying to make, but the community that existed and needed them. So it became a, it is an act of service. And I think that that was what was really attractive to me about coming back and being with them. And I guess, so one thing I want to hone in on and emphasize is the, First of all, the collaboration, right? Yeah. The ability for people say it all the time. I end every podcast interview with, "What do you think Columbus is doing well?" Congratulations, you're going to get asked that too. Oh, and one of the I things that is a very common <laughs> refrain is collaboration is so much easier here, yeah. and it is because of folks' willingness to sit down for that coffee. Or, and I guess what I want to push back on sort of is like, is that our kindness? Is that our availability? Is that just the culture? I think it's a combination of, um, all of that and a, a kind of scrappiness still, Mm. um, that people aren't afraid to get in the, in the dirt here still. Yeah. I don't think anybody is, is there, there's a, a, prete- a lack of pretension here yeah. that still exists in a, in a, in a real way. And so I do think it's a kindness. I do think it's the Ohio nice 
quality yeah. that I always get accused of having in in any city I go to. Okay. Uh, I go everywhere and I make eye contact with everyone and I smile openly and they're like, yeah, but that's, you can't be from Ohio. Sorry, <laughs> Mark, that's you. Like that's not not necessarily. Uh, I don't know that we gave that to you. I don't oh, want to take credit for oh. it. But I will say. Just coming on to another point that you had, like when I was growing up and still doing creative work Mm. in producing theater, producing arts events. Yeah. There was always a fear before the the house opened or the doors opened that no one would come. Yeah. I cannot think of any crazy thing I did that people weren't there people were there and like this i don't think i can depend on facebook for the entire like the dating yourself there too well but the the very early facebook like that's some of us that's my show what we used it for right but like doing the laramie project 10 years later or exposing folks to visual art through live music like Yeah. yeah maybe that's some of the curation but a lot of it is like, oh, here's this thing happening. Well, I think, uh, uh, to your point, I think that there's a curiosity here as mm-hmm. well. So I think it's the kindness. I think it's uh, the scrappiness of getting your hands dirty and do rolling up your sleeves and moving the boxes and doing the work. Mm-hmm. There's not that hierarchy that exists in a lot of other places here. Everyone's kind of in it together. And then there's a genuine curiosity from our audiences here across all spectrums mm-hmm. of art and and you know, sports, food, everything. Everyone is genuinely curious to try things out and form an opinion about it. And I think that's partly because we have so many academic institutions around the area. I think a lot of people um, come here with a value system that they want to shake up a little bit hmm. if they're coming from another uh, another smaller city right. or smaller town a lot we feed so many of the small towns and small cities in, in Ohio and around the the region that people want to come here and be like I want to see things I've never seen so I can respond to them right. I want to see and they're open in a way and curious in a way that I think certainly in a in a city like New York where I live um there's so much noise and so much coming at you all the time. You almost have to wait for like critics and reviews and things to to validate or, that, or to make right. help you make the decision whether or not to go. And right. so you see things where the first two weeks of an event, if you're doing a show, you, you you're giving away tickets, and then the reviews come out, and then you can't get a seat for the rest of the run. Right. Or vice versa, the reviews come out, and then you're giving away tickets. Right. So I mean, and and here it's a it's a lot. the The stakes aren't as high. But the work is so much more um, thoughtful and authentic, and you can take more risks. Mm -hmm. I think particularly in the visual art scene here, there's so much more. The art scene here is so vibrant and so alive. Also, because you have a lot of space. Mm -hmm. Because you need space as an artist, and you can't... It's so much. It's, it's so expensive to rent out studio space, and if you've got a, an extra room in your house here in Columbus, you can make your art in your home right. and still close the door at the end of the day and like have yeah. dinner with your kids. Right. Let that be separate. Exactly. What else are you coming back for? Oh, I come back for so many things. Um, I come back for the local businesses that I love. I come back for um, the food. Mm -hmm. Um, I come back for the ease of life here. Um, I breathe better here. Um, I finally, finally, so I've been a runner for, God, how many years? Uh, 30 plus years um, and I finally found the Alum Creek Running Trail after after 20 years of trying to find it. Um, I finally found it, so I have a whole new running path through Columbus, so I love to do that. Um, I love places like, um, I'm just going to rattle out, like 
Spoonful Records mm-hmm. is my favorite record store in America. In America, and I've been to every record store in America, okay. in every major city. Um, Spoonful, um, they are uh, the, the two, the the couple that run it are the nicest people, the most um, knowledgeable, the most open about chatting with a weird dude who wants to talk about Deep Purple, mm-hmm. um, and also about a, a, a tween who wants to like talk about the Taylor Swift re-recording that's coming out, and um, they just they. Their taste is excellent. Their curation is like, Mwah. and uh, and I love spending time in the store. And I always find something um, I wasn't. I come in always with a list because I get very overwhelmed. Mm-hmm. And often I've called ahead to be like, "Can you pull this and this and this?" And then I'll be in. Um, I always find something else to to take with me from that. And I mm-hmm. think that that's a great. I, I love them dearly, and I've 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 followed them in multiple moves and. They're amazing. And then um, $2 Radio, the fact that $2 Radio is in Columbus is a miracle to me. Mm-hmm. And that Eliza and Eric uh, are choosing to stay in Columbus as they build this amazing publishing imprint that they have now. It's, it's, they, and they're the, 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 again, the kindest people. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I just was, um, you picked me up at $2 Radio. I did. At the headquarters. And Eric, the owner and the founder of the... He was serving coffee. Serving coffee and talking to people. And, and I just, they're the ideal of what you want a book publisher to be. And and I, I've been lucky enough on my podcast, all I want to do is talk about Madonna. We have... Uh, Highlight. To be clear, that is the name of that your podcast. is the name of the podcast. It's called "All I Want to Do Is Talk About Madonna." Right, and uh, and uh, we we had Zach, one of their writers, on just recently um, to talk about his book. I sing for the waiting to use the waiting, and um, all the writers I know who work with them are just elated and honored and and thrilled with how they're treated, how the books come out. Mm-hmm. Their books are just amazing. And then I, you know, Jenny Britton Power, baby. Jenny Britton Power. Every time I try and, and flirt with another ice cream, I'm talking about you, Salt and Straw in L.A. <laughs> I go to there and I'm like, maybe Salt and Straw is my favorite. And then I come back to Columbus and Jenny Britton Bauer and her Jenny's ice cream just, you know, gets, get, wets my whistle once again. <laughs> Um, with one of the flavors, and 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 I love coming back for for Jenny. Yeah, let pivot a little bit and tell me what how you think Columbus is perceived. Obviously, I, we know how you feel. Yeah, you love it. You want to come do. back here. It's your 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 home away from. Yeah, right. But yeah. what when you talk to folks who. Uh, are familiar with Columbus. Yeah. Maybe they've been here. Maybe they haven't. But they certainly have. May have a perception. What do you think that perception is? Um, it's interesting because Columbus continues to be this in in a lot of places in the country a, a kind of secret secret mm-hmm. still because um, there's multiple Columbuses in in the country. There's Columbus, Missouri. There's Columbus, Georgia. Mm-hmm. There's all these different places that are called Columbus. Um, and we do not yet, and I see this as a big asset, we don't evoke an instant image when we say the name Columbus, Ohio yet. Mm -hmm. Um, Thankfully, it's not always tied to Ohio State and the Buckeyes, Mm -hmm. much to my dad's chagrin, Um, (laughs) though he's very happy he gets to still come and see, take his season tickets at the, at, the stadium, but um, it's not like Austin or Nashville or Portland or any of these cities where you, or, or Atlanta mm-hmm. where you say the name and it, it conjures up an image or right. Chicago even has it conjures up an image. We're still our, our kind of our own thing. Um, so it means different things to different people. I think it's very much a city of doers. I think a lot of people that I know um, who are working in Columbus um, from other places and coming, oh, I'm going to Columbus. I'm going to get a lot done that week. There's mm-hmm. a lot of doing here. There's not a lot of ta- sitting around talking about doing stuff with your arms folded. Mm-hmm. People like get down to it and, and start moving on stuff here in a way that I think um, is both um, overwhelming sometimes, especially when you're used to kind of the the quietness and the, the quote unquote sleepy town. Mm-hmm. Um, 
but they're also it, it it also is a very like exciting thing because every time I come back something is changing something new is developing so it's an evolving I think that's also the perception that Columbus is ever evolving Mm -hmm. and it's not going to I asked a friend you know like if the you know what their when their city that she was from Portland Oregon and when she felt the city plateaued mm. right because there was a point when Portland kind of hit a an apex right. in the culture Portlandia all of those kinds of things and and she said do you think Columbus has plateaued and I think I don't think Columbus will ever plateau because and I think that's the perception because it continues to redefine what it is right. over and over again. And I think that that's what's so interesting about it and um, and dynamic in this way. And you've got so many people here that are lifers. Mm-hmm. And that's a very exciting thing that people that choose to to make their lives here and stay and 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 do and are invested in their communities and do the things that need to be done within that community. Fair. Okay. I, and sorry, lots of thoughts in my head about like, is that leaning in by virtue of how easy it is to lean in? And is uh, the, yeah. Oh, well, I think I think you can also, it, it's very easy to know your neighbors and know mm-hmm. the people and know the people you're working alongside. I mean, if I need to talk to somebody in leadership at any organization, it's usually a phone, and I don't live here. Right. I, I can make a phone call or send one email and I've got them on the phone. Like mm-hmm. everyone's so approachable. And if you know your na- it, it's much, it's very easy to jump in when it, you're helping your neighbors out. I mean, that, that sounds kind of Pollyanna-ish, but it, it, it can be a very rare thing. Yeah. No, it's certainly a virtue. Absolutely. Yeah. I guess what, what negative perceptions do you think there are? Um, I think, um, that it's a drinking town. Okay. That it's a um, a city of Midwestern cars. Okay. Um, our our freeway system is very um, dramatic, and uh, I think people know the the two seventy loop and like, oh, you're just driving around two seventy all the time. <laughs> I'm like, well, not really. Right. Um, I think also, uh, I uh, to, you know, to to be political, I think the the elections of the last few cycles have kind of painted Columbus as like, aren't you supposed to be holding up the blue status of Ohio? Right. Um, and I think it's done an amazing job in the last couple of years with definitely rebuking the, the uh, ban on abortion in the Mm -hmm. state and things like that. I mean, these are smart, educated, engaged voters and citizens here. So I think that is not necessarily true, but I know that when the state turns the other way from wherever your political leanings are, people are always like, Columbus, what happened? Because hmm. it can literally be Columbus that decides mm-hmm. the state. In Columbus a lot and of- surroundings, certainly. Yeah, correct. So yeah. I think that those are kind of some of the, the knocks it gets. But, you know, I don't listen to those. So personally, yeah, you have recently quit your job. Uh, it's true. It's true. I've quit my job. Now, and I left my, like, we yeah. concluded it. We concluded our, our time together in Why? a good way. Um, I, um, I loved my job. I was the, uh, an exe- I was the uh, executive assistant to a CEO of a, of a global communications firm. Mm-hmm. And we did so much in six and a half years of growth and, um, and navigating the pandemic and all of that. And um, there came a time about a year ago, or a, a little over a year ago, where I felt that we had kind of concluded what we were doing together and in a great way in a, in a warm, wonderful, beautiful way. And, uh, and we spent about a, you know, six months to almost a year talking about how to conclude and to find a replacement and and do all of those things. And, you know, I really like to build things Mm -hmm. and, and grow things, um, and, and help people with visions realize and realize those visions and make space for more growth, Mm -hmm. which I think is really, um, uh, 
important to me and I felt like it was time for a new adventure. And so I, I kind of, and I've never stopped. I mean, I've been somebody who's worked and worked and worked and worked and never really taken a moment. And so right now I'm just kind of like, is that the plan? Take a moment, take a moment and just chill for a while and see what comes up. Cause I don't, I think this culture is so loud and fast and responses are expected immediately. Mm -hmm. I mean, think how many text messages we send in a day to something that doesn't need to be responded to today. Right. But we feel this need to, and I feel like I really need to, um, I'm trying to step back and just like let the river run in, let the river run, let the (laughs) river run in front of me and just see what comes up for me because I'm not, doing this, doing this, doing this, doing this, doing this, doing this, doing this. Right. To see what... Step out of the river and correct. see what comes up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And allow the river to keep going. Like everyone else is swirling around me doing everything they need to do. But I don't... I think it's very... It, it's it's a very uncomfortable position for someone like me to be in. Mm-hmm. To, to, to just sit there and be like, I'm hanging out. I'm chilling. Mm-hmm. Which, you know... It, it, it's a it's a privileged position to be in, but I've worked really hard to get to have that opportunity. Fair, yeah. What do you think Columbus does well? It's trying to depart from the cheerleading that we were doing yeah. before, but from your perspective, I think Columbus makes space very well for diversity, for difference of opinion for different kinds of human experiences, Mm -hmm. for different ways of moving through the world. And um, it allows for all of those to coexist, not always peacefully. Sometimes Mm -hmm. there's a lot of conflict, but um, in its best moments, it it is all allowed to coexist in one space together and that everybody is mindful of each other's space and their experiences and their kind of ways they're going about their lives and um, allowing that all to be together in one place. And what is Columbus not doing so well? Dun, dun, dun. Um, I think I would love to see uh, more opportunities in film here. Mm. Um, I'd love to see more movies shot here, uh, of national, like prof- national big movies. Mm-hmm. I wish there was a way to um, highlight the the many landscapes here. I mean, if you want to do a haunted house movie in the middle of a field, you can shoot that in Columbus. Mm-hmm. If you want to do a skyscraper chase in a Batman movie, you could do it in Columbus. And um, and so I, I, I'm hopeful that that will change over the next few years where people can find a way to highlight the geographical benefits here because mm-hmm. there's so many different terrains and different ways um, to make more stories happen out of Columbus. There you go. Yeah. Mark, thanks for your time. Thank you, Tim. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Confluence Cast presented by Columbus Underground. Again, you can get more information on what we discussed today in the show notes for this episode at theconfluencecast.com. Please rate, subscribe, share this episode of the Confluence Cast with your friends, family, contacts, enemies, your favorite playwright. If you're interested in sponsoring the Confluence Cast, get in touch with us. We can be reached by email at info at theconfluencecast.com. Our theme music was composed by Benji Robinson. Our producer is Philip Cogley. I'm your host, Tim Fulton. Have a great week. <laughs>